Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's TechSoup webinar, Create Dynamic Online Trainings. We are using ReadyTalk today, and all of your lines are muted, and we'll be using the chat for communication. So please feel free to enter your questions or comments into the chat. Uh, that will only go to the presenters. And please uh, send us any questions or comments you have. Uh, we'll share out anything that's appropriate to share with the entire audience. If you do lose your connection, just go ahead and rejoin using the link in your confirmation email. Or uh, by phone, just uh, if you happen to be on our audio connection, you can recall the conference using that same number. If you happen to be disconnected and, or have to leave and uh, cannot rejoin us, we will be recording this webinar. And we will uh, send out the information for that recording in a follow-up email. Uh, also, if you happen to be tweeting today, go ahead and use the hashtag TechSoup. And so once again, we're uh, talking about creating dynamic online trainings today. And let me take just a minute to tell you about your presenters. I'm Crystal Schimpf, and I'm a guest webinar producer at TechSoup, and I'm also a trainer at the Colorado State Library. With me today on the call, we have Janet Fouts, who is a social media account a social media coach and a senior partner at Tattoo Digital Media, and Kyle Andre, who is a research analyst at Idealware. Unfortunately, Laura Quinn was not able to join us today, um, but she will be available for some follow-up questions if there's anything we're not able to answer. Assisting with chat today, we have Don Krause, Kevin Lowe, and Stephanie Gerding. So thank you for them uh, for their joining us today. And so let's uh, take a look at what we're going to talk about today. Uh, to start off, Janet will cover an overview of the basics of, of various types of online training and some tips for planning, preparing, and creating online training. Kyle and Laura will talk about how to use video and other interactive tools to engage your audience in online training. And I'm sorry, that will be just Kyle will be talking about the videos and interactive tools uh, to engage your audience in online training. And we will have a few spots for questions and answers from you, the audience. So uh, please feel free to put those questions in the chat anytime, and we'll get to them as we are able to. And so to begin, let's just take a little uh, poll and see what your experience is in cre creating online training. So take a look at these options. Let us know what uh, uh, most applies to you. And if you would like, go ahead and uh, put into the chat maybe some of the specific types of online training you have created. I'll give you just a minute to do this. And if we see anything good in the chat, we'll make sure to share that out with everyone. Okay. I see um, mostly video trainings. Someone doing webinars for the genealogy community. That sounds interesting. Online training lessons about ILSs. I see flash tutorials, captivate uh, training. Oh, some trainings for the over 55 crowd. That looks interesting. And I see lots of things coming into the, the, tra the chat here. Teacher training, taking over continuing education. All of the docent tour training online. That sounds interesting. Online training for wildlife rehabilitation techniques. We have a real variety of topics coming in and also types of, of uh, training. So, an email campaign training. So various types in here. We'll go ahead and close down the poll. It looks like most people have had a chance to respond. And so we'll just cl close that down in 3, 2, 1. And take a look at this. And uh, looks like uh, most people have never created online training before. So this will hopefully provide a nice overview for those of you who have not created online training or who have only dabbled in online training, maybe a little bit here or there. Um, and that a few of you have created quite a bit of online training or, or create some from time to time. So it is uh, nice to see we have a, a variety in the audience today. And hopefully what we provide for you will be helpful. And thank you for those of you who put your responses in the chat. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. All right. 
Well, we will go ahead and uh, get started. And uh, I'm going to hand it over in just a minute here to Janet to give us an overview of the types of online training. And uh, she's going to give us some tips on planning and preparation as well. She brings expertise as a social media coach uh, from her work at Tattoo Digital Media, and also from presenting webinars and online trainings on a regular basis for profit and nonprofit organizations. So Janet, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited that there are a lot of you who haven't done online training because this is going to be a really good primer. But if you're already experienced, I hope you're going to learn some things too. I'm going to go really fast because I don't have a lot of time. So if I skip over things, please remember that there is a Q&A session, and we will also be answering questions in TechSoup's forums after this presentation. So I want to just gloss over real quickly what types of online training there are. And there are quite a few. Um, you know, there's email drip campaigns and then controlling access to content, videos, Google Hangouts, sharing PDFs, slides, things that you can email around, and webinars like this one. And I'm going to go into these a little bit more deeply as we continue. So your first question, of course, is who is the market for this training? Is it for your staff? Is it for volunteers for the nonprofit? Maybe it's for potential donors to educate them on what you do and how you do it. Uh, if it's for staff, is it for internal staff or remote staff? Or are you doing it as a public service like you would be for the donors to give them more information about what you should do and why they should care? So there's a lot of different reasons. And each of those reasons is crucial to what your delivery platform is. If you're going to be delivering it on a really broad scale, then you need something that has a broader reach. You also want to think about what the skill level of the market is. If the market has a lot of um, a very low um, a very low uh, knowledge of using social media or online media then you have to control that. Maybe they're going to be email people. They may not be people that you can use high levels of technology with. So you want to make sure that you think very carefully about who the market is before you create your campaigns. Create for the market instead of creating content and then wondering why the market isn't using it. The first thing I wanted to just cover was email drip campaigns. This is the kind of thing that uh, we do it with a tool called HubSpot that allows us to send out emails that are very specific to the interests of the group. And I can send out an email on a weekly or a daily or a monthly basis letting them know information that's in a specific channel of interest. And it allows me to control how that goes. People can opt in at any point in the cycle even if I've already sent out three or four or five lessons, when they join, they go back to the first lesson, and they start the program at the beginning. It's a really great way to be able to deliver really great information without uh, people having to jump into the middle, or worse yet, you having to say, oh, well, you can't join now. We're not starting another session until next month. If you need to educate people as they drop in, this is great for volunteers or new staff so that you can kind of lead them along. I find that a lot of times uh, people set up these trainings, and then as someone new comes onto the organization, there's no process in place to make sure that they're included. And so people get dropped out. You want to be able to lead them through and be able to build something in advance that they can just be handed. And the email is a really great way to do that. You've got to be organized. You should be organized for any kind of training so that you know what you're doing and what people want to get from this. And if they really don't, um, if they don't have a high end of technology, then email is a really easy way to do this. One of the ways that I do that is by setting up uh, WordPress classes, for example. And I will walk people through how to set up WordPress, and then, okay, now we're going to set up users. Now we're going to do posts. I find it much more effective than giving people a whole huge portfolio of information. Sometimes it's just overwhelm. 
So starting a little small and dripping them information kind of leads them along and lets them learn a little more regularly. Once this is set up, it's really low maintenance. Another one that's very similar, which I also use, is member access to content. I do this through WordPress because I love WordPress and it's easy to use. It's got lots of plugins that you can use to manage this. Works the same way as the email that you're controlling access. Today I'm going to release the first tutorial. Tomorrow I'm going to release a second one. This again keeps people from being inundated with information that they just can't, uh, can't all digest at once. If you need to feed them things slowly, you can do that. Once they reach the end, they can go back and access all of the content. But if you just dump it on them, they may not absorb as much, and they may be overwhelmed. Just like email, this is, you've got to be organized to get it out. Once it's organized and done, it's very low maintenance and easy to keep up. Video screen capture, another one of my favorites. I call this chase the cursor because you know it's when you follow the cursor and say, okay, we're going to click here, we're going to click here, then do this, then do that. It's a very easy tutorial style. Um, I create these for my clients when I'm doing consulting. Uh, if somebody has a problem with a particular platform, I can go in in a few minutes, give them a video, and step by step say, do this, do this, do this, and then do this. This is a really great tool because now, once the client has it, they can come back to it later and refresh. Because, you know, in a lot of um, coaching situations or technical situations, you don't really remember it until you do it yourself. And then you go, oh, what did she say? I don't really know what she said. I, I kind of remember things. And then we have an email exchange. Much easier if I can just tell you how to work it then give you a demo that you keep as an archive. Uh, you could keep these in an archive on your intranet or uh, on a website so that people can go back and access them. Somebody who does this really well for nonprofits besides me is John Hayden. Uh, if you want a link to some of his tutorials, then just send me an email and I'll give you a link to John Hayden if you don't know him already. He does great stuff on Facebook. He's fabulous. So um, these kind of video tutorials are, are really useful. Make them short. Make them quick. Make sure that you're set up, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Once you do these tutorials, you can share them as well. Um, moving on to PDFs and slides, uh, there's a couple of different ways. You know, If you've got a step-by-step -step training uh, that people can walk through very easily, maybe it's 10 steps to do something right. Um, if it's something you're going to share with your volunteers, for example, you might want to put it on Scribed. That can, that's a resource for sharing PDFs or eBooks, and people can go and get them and share them easily. You can make them paid or unpaid. Uh, SlideShare is another one of my favorites. My SlideShare account is slideshare.net slash jfouts, F-O-U-T-S. And I'll put these slides up there later so you can see how it works. Um, it's a great resource for learning, and it's also a great resource for sharing a series of slides. You can also share videos. You can annotate your slides. Dropbox is another really great resource. Pretty much anybody can access Dropbox. You can use it as a repository for your video tutorials. You can share your PDFs. You can share eBooks there. A lot of things you can do through Dropbox to share information. So obviously webinars work very, very well. One of the things that I've found out about webinars is your first webinar, you may not get a lot of people to it. If you build a regular system so that you have a weekly or a monthly webinar, people begin to expect it, they begin to look forward to it, and you build a following. So it's the repetition that's important about webinars. It's also really important to record them because quite frankly, not everybody stays for the whole webinar. Again, you know, if you inundate people with a lot of information and they want to go back and see what you said, a recording, and this particular webinar is recorded, going back to it for reference 
is very, very valuable. So make sure that you give that to people that you are doing webinars for. I like GoToMeeting for webinars, but I also like ReadyTalk. Both of them are really great platforms. Adobe Connect is another one that a lot of people use. And there's a free resource called Join.me that's a good webinar platform as well. When you do webinars, try to stay very focused on what your topic is, and don't give people too broad a scope of information. It's better to do several webinars in small chunks than to try to cover all of social media in one webinar. Again, if people get overwhelmed, they're just going to glaze over and they're not going to come back. So I've said get organized at least four times, and it really is very key. Find out who your market is. What are their best delivery mediums? Then take that against what your best delivery medium is. If video isn't your thing, don't do it. If text is your thing, then maybe that's where you should go. If you don't have the tools or the skill set, think about bringing other people in, uh, like what TechSoup did with this webinar. Who do you know? Who do you want to know? Who can help educate? And how can you bring that all together? Once you've got that all together, outline the goals. And I like to do wireframes. Um, I do them with mind mapping tools. I do a lot of whiteboarding. I fill in a lot of stuff, and I see where things are going to go. And then I decide, is this one one-off lesson? Is it a group of lessons? How will those be structured? How will they be delivered? And then I time them out so that I know what the delivery process and timing is going to be. Some recording tips. Um, this is my favorite microphone. Um, it's the, called the Blue Snowball. Blue Snowballs are really great because they have noise canceling features. Uh, if you are going to uh, record a webinar or a video, for example, uh, these microphones work really, really well. I recommend that people do one long take. If you are going to be doing a video, for example, maybe you are going to be doing a podcast, do one long take and then edit it later. Uh, it's very common for people to do chase the cursor videos, and then they make a mistake, and they go back and do the whole thing over again. This can take you forever. Teach yourself to break your cursor videos up. Pause periodically so that if you have to go back and edit it, it's not going to be a big break in your delivery. Uh, so you know, do it all in one long take with the intention that you may have to edit. Make sure that you test your mic and your video recording every time before you start and do the whole thing. If you do a whole long take and you find out at the end that your audio wasn't right or that your video wasn't recording the correct screen, you're going to be really unhappy. So do a little quick test. Make sure everything looks good, and then go ahead and do it. It's much better if you practice, practice, practice before you do a video if you're doing tutorials. You want to sound natural, conversational. You want to kind of explore with people and explain to them how things work. If you seem to be droning on and reading a script, and this is how you do it, it's not really something that I'm going to be interested in participating in. I'm not going to finish it. So make sure that it's interesting and lively. Do it in your natural voice. If you are not comfortable with that, have somebody sit in a chair across from you that you can actually talk to so that you've got somebody that you are delivering to, and that might help a little bit with the voice. Make sure that you are sizing for the delivery format as well. Uh, if you are going to be delivering it on blogs, great. If you are going to be putting it on TV, that's a little different video size. I, can't, I don't really have time to get into that too much. But I can help you with that if you want to email me or contact me through uh, the forums. But you really want to think about, again, how am I delivering this? What's the best format to deliver it in? Then you want to remember to market it. Now this may not always be the case if you are delivering it for staff or volunteers. But 
even then there's some internal marketing. Hey, everybody, we've got a great suite of videos. We just put them up. I'd love your feedback. I'd love to hear what you uh, would add to it. Uh, what, are, what are we missing? So that kind of internal marketing. If it's something for potential donors or the public, then using social media to market is really great. Make sure that if you're putting it on YouTube, you've set up a good YouTube channel, that it's very clear, and then leverage all your social media networks and your email networks to market this. If you don't market it and you don't get a bunch of hits in the first, say, few days, it can kind of fade off of YouTube and people don't find it. So then you've got to send it to them again. Think about what your marketing program is going to be, how often you're going to have to market it to keep this going and make it really work for you. This is uh, my connection information. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm always available, and I'm very happy to do that. I'll also be watching the TechSoup forums to see if there's anything that I can answer there as well. I'm going to go right. ahead and try to look through the questions too. All right, Janet. Well, thank you so much um, for this great, valuable information. And you shared a lot of resources and links, places people can go either for tools or for examples. And we are collecting those links, and we'll be sharing them out. I just want to make sure everyone knows that we'll be sending out a follow-up email uh, which will include the recording of the webinar and uh, the links, and also the link to the, the forum where we will continue to have a discussion about this topic. So um, anything we're not able to get to today will end up in that follow-up email. And uh, we do have a few minutes for questions right now, and we've been getting some good ones in. So um, uh, Janet, I'll just ask you a few questions right now if you don't mind. Um, Great. From one person, they asked, what is the difference between an email drip campaign and emailing out an educational newsletter? Or is that the same thing? Oh, that's a great question. So sending out the email newsletter, unless you're archiving it on a website, doesn't really allow people to drop in. If they haven't been in since the beginning of the newsletter, they may miss a lot of really good information. So you can archive that and let people dig through it. Or in a training – and, and with newsletters, people tend to use that for more general, broader information. But with training, you want it to be very specific to a particular channel. Say you're training people on how to use a CMS then you're going to want to drip that information from here's how you sign up and set up your profile to more advanced things. And if someone's going to come in in the middle, you want them to start at the beginning. So if they sign up and you've already sent out five, a drip campaign will send them back to square one about setting up your profile. Great. And is there a particular service? You might have mentioned the name of an email service that does this. I, set, I use HubSpot, which is really a um, content management system, and a, uh, it, it does a lot of different things. So one of the things that it does is allow you to send out these drip campaigns. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of a couple others, and I'm drawing a blank. I think Blue Sky also has one, and so that's another one, and a Weber can send out drip campaigns as well. Great. Um, we had another question. What is a cursor video? That was something you had mentioned. <laughs> I call the video tutorials where you follow the cursor from step to step to step. Chase the cursor tutorials. All right. And uh, we have some people asking, what are your favorite uh, tools for editing uh, audio and uh, video, or one or the other depending? <laughs> Well, for audio, I really still like Audacity. I'm on a Mac, and so that's easiest for me. Um, I also use ScreenFlow. And ScreenFlow is the app that I use for all of my tutorials. It's uh, really easy to edit. You can add a lot of effects. It's got a lot of, um, it's got a lot of tools in a really inexpensive package. And I just find it to be the best tool for me. And is that a free tool, or is there a charge to it? I think it's $49 or $60. It's very inexpensive. And it's a one-time fee, and then you get lifetime upgrades. 
And uh, somebody asked, uh, what do you think of sharing via Google Docs? I like sharing via Google Docs a lot. I have a couple of issues with it. One is that it seems Google goes down a lot, and so then people lose access. Um, I'm also running a lot more into people who can't access Google Docs because of firewall issues. So it depends on your organization. It seems that Dropbox has less um, resistance to that, but since I do work with some financial companies, they don't let you access Google Docs, and so it doesn't always work. Mm, yeah, something definitely to consider. Um, and. Uh, then here's another question. If you're doing a live webinar, are there any tools, especially free, that would allow small group discussions or partner talk? Uh, Join Me is very good for that. GoToMeeting is very inexpensive. Those are both, both ones that you can use. And you know what? Skype tools are pretty darn good these days. You can do screen share. You can have a good conversation. Uh, so you know, if you don't have to record it, that's a really good option as well. Um, um, and we've got some more people uh, to go back to the chase uh, the cursor idea or these cursor videos. Um, what tools do you use to, to create those, or how are they made? I use ScreenFlow for that. It can capture my screen, and it captures the entire screen and the audio at the same time. And then I can crop it later down to whatever size I need and publish automatically to YouTube. So it works really well. It allows me to do the zoom in and zoom out. Another really good tool is Camtasia. I like that a lot to be able to, to follow the cursor and I can decide if I'm going to highlight the cursor, am I going to put a, a circle of light around it, am I going to zoom in on it. Both of these tools will do basically the same thing. Uh, look for techsmith.com for Camtasia. And I don't have the URL in my head for ScreenFlow, but if you Google it, you'll find it. All right. Thanks. Yeah, of course, we're all interested in tools that we can use that are low or no cost always. Um, sometimes we do have to pay for them, but uh, it's always nice to find things that are less expensive. So, yeah, and um, I lean towards the low cost and inexpensive as well. Absolutely. And then we have one uh, interesting question, um, wondering what your thoughts are on the Khan Academy approach to learning and training. And for those listening that maybe aren't familiar, that's K-H-A-N Academy, um, which is a series of trainings online that are freely available. So what are your thoughts on that? I think they're brilliant, absolutely brilliant. There's so many things that you can learn out there. You know, you look at what they're doing, Look at what Stanford is doing on iTunes. They're putting out entire, MIT is doing it too, putting out entire courses that you can go and take. There are so many learning opportunities. The one thing that I'd like to say that is a huge difference between, for example, uh, Stanford or Harvard or MIT and Khan Academy, Academy is that Khan Academy is really hard to say and is, um, much less produced. Don't worry so much about overproducing what you're trying to teach. People want to learn from an individual. It doesn't have to look like CNBC. Make it informative. Make sure the sound is good, and you're good to go. Great. Yeah, and I think that's very good advice. And also, it's great that that question came up because, of course, um, there are many resources of trainings that are available out there to take advantage of. So we'll get those links into the follow-up email. And uh, we're going to go ahead and move on at this point. Um, thank you, Janet. And hopefully we'll have some time at the end to get back to some of these other questions. We have some, some more really excellent questions coming in. And just a reminder, if we don't get to all of the questions uh, in the session today, we will send uh, a follow-up email with a forum where those questions uh, will be answered following the webinar. My pleasure, and I'll try to answer some of these questions in the chat. And if anybody wants to tweet me on Twitter, I'm Jay Fouts. Uh, feel free to tweet me as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Janet. And so now we'll move on to uh, hear Kyle talk a little bit about his experiences with 
online training at Idealware. Uh, Idealware is a nonprofit that provides resources so other nonprofits can make smart software decisions. Kyle produces a series of Ask Idealware videos and also produces live trainings. So he's going to share his experience on how you can make online training more dynamic with videos and interactive tools. Kyle? Hi, thanks. Um, first, can everyone hear me? If people can't hear me, let me know. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Good, thank you. Uh, my uh, phone, the mute button doesn't have a light on it. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is just kind of look at what we at Idealware have done in the world of online training, um, which is a pretty good amount. And I think I'm going to start with uh, sort of the, the easier, cheaper things uh, and work up to the more complicated stuff. So uh, sort of the first step that we use, one of our most basic thing, is just videos. Um, this is actually a, a screen capture of one of our Ask Idealware videos, which um, we've mentioned before. It's a series of videos that we do, uh, really short guerrilla style videos, um, which are just basic, straightforward, low production videos for the Internet. And here we have, you know, basically there's the whole premise is I'm a person who works at Idealware and I'm going to answer a simple question. Um, so here we have Andrea, our Director of Partnerships and Learning, um, who just in about a three-minute video explained sort of the basics of getting liked on Facebook. Um, this is a pretty good approach. It's sort of similar to things, uh, you know, like like previously mentioned, like the Khan Academy, which, uh, you know, it's just a very quick video. You can access it online, um, and really all you need to do this uh, is just a camera and uh, a little bit of basic editing software. We just use a flip camera uh, on a tripod, which is pretty cheap and gets a pretty good quality to it. Um, and then really for editing software, all you really need is something that can put titles in it. It doesn't have to be as fancy as we've used. Um, but we just use uh, Adobe Premiere Elements, which is pretty cheap and pretty powerful for being a really low-end system. Um, and you can actually get that from TechSoup for I think about 15 bucks. So uh, definitely on the low end um, as far as cost goes. This is a pretty nice little, you know, having these online videos is a good way to just answer simple questions or explain simple things. Um, the nice thing about putting it on YouTube uh, is you have your channel. So you have all of your videos in one place for people to look for. Um, and if you see, we've got the link at the bottom to the Ask Idealware YouTube channel, um, which has all the videos we've produced. Um, and then sort of the next step up from videos as far as online training that we use is sort of the presenter-led training. Um, this is kind of familiar. This is something like we're doing right now in ReadyTalk. Um, these are the online conferencing tools. Um, Ideal where uh, you know here we use webinars. Uh, let's see, we do an hour and a half webinar almost every week. Um, some of them are free, but most are paid. Um, and it's a fairly, as we've mentioned before, it's sort of a very basic, um, sort of very straightforward, uh, just class sort of setting. And you're always going to have a a core group of people who will do it. Um, but here we have different topics um, for different weeks and for different times. So we have a multitude of social media trainings, and it's split up by topic like here's just a basic introduction to what social media is, and then maybe here's how you measure social media. Um, you know, as, as Janet mentioned, you know, uh, a live webinar is a pretty good way to just sort of, you know, have a little bit of back and forth and have some good, um, you know, and, and that's through the chat or online. Um, and it's pretty, just a pretty nice straightforward way to teach one thing. <laughs> and you can do it in a series. And so the next step beyond that is the recorded seminars. And these are basically what we do. These are just our webinars that we've presented. We record them every time. Um, 
so people who have you know, seen a webinar get that recording. But we also sell those recordings uh, on our website for, for a discounted price. And that way people can, you know, unlike a live webinar where here you have to take an hour, an hour and a half out of your workday to you know, listen to it and, and watch it, this way you can you know, see it on your own time. Um, the only downside to this, uh, you know, the only downside to listening to it on your own um, on your own time is that you don't get uh, the ability to ask questions and have them answered. So you do miss out on that. But it's it's still a pretty good way of delivering educational content um, as as needed or on demand, as opposed to scheduling it out. Um, so what we're going to do is stop for questions right now, just sort of on these on these lower end uh, methods before we go into the bit more complicated methods. And um, great, I Kyle. See, oh yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I've been kind of tracking the questions in the background, and um, I know that one that has come up is, um, can you recommend some basic video editing software, and preferably something that is free or a low cost? Yeah, um, we actually have an article about this um, on the Idealware website um, called "A Few Good Tools for Video Editing." Um, so, what I've worked with in the past for video editing that's fairly low end. Um, there's sort of the big three low end ones, which are iTunes, uh, Windows Movie Maker, and Adobe Premiere Elements. Um, iTunes comes free with um, all Mac computers, um, and it's very it's it's very easy to use and pretty straightforward. Um, it's one of the stronger of those three tools. Um, the only downside to it is you need to pay for a Mac, which is more expensive. Um, right. <laughs> and then with uh, with any Windows machines, any PCs, you get Windows Movie Maker, which is a it's good if you're adding a few basic um, if you're adding some titles or if you need to do some very simple editing. Um, but I found overall it's not quite as user friendly as iTunes uh, or Adobe is. Uh, and it doesn't handle as many different types of uh, video files. Right. And, uh, and then the third and one in that is Adobe Premiere Elements, mm -hmm. um, which I mentioned before. It's suspiciously similar to iMovie. Um, it's fairly straightforward to use, and it's very flexible as far as um, how you can publish it. You have a lot of different um, you have a lot of different options for file size or what type of file. Um, and that one's uh, for nonprofits. You can get that for about fifteen dollars um, through TechSoup. Great. Those are great recommendations. And and it is iMovie, uh, just to clarify. Yes, I think I said iTunes on accident at the beginning, so I'm glad uh, I'm glad uh, Mark and a few other people caught me on that. That's okay. That's quite all right. <laughs> um, and uh, some people are asking questions about um, the capturing live webinars and um, uh, how that works. So wondering. Um, uh, with the recorded webinar, once you record it, can participants stop and pause the webinar to return to the same point? Uh, yes, yeah. with a recorded webinar like something from ReadyTalk, you do have um, – here, I can actually go back and see. Um, you actually do have sort of a play bar at the back, and it actually will show every time it shows a different slide is what those green marks are. So that lets you um, – you know, we, we publish these online, so you access this online. Um, you can certainly do it uh, in a recorded file format, but we find it really easy to have it online. Um, and you can go, um, you know, you can let it load, and you can go to various points, um, and you have access to that as long as that exists on the internet. <laughs> Great. And, and just one last question before we continue on is, uh, you know, between uh, webinars, which are generally a longer format, um, you know, but is there a kind of ideal length for the video tutorials that you talked about creating? Um, so with with online video, shorter is better, um, and just sort of in in video experience working in. Um, 
for-profit video production. Um, you know, my experience in the adage we go to is the proper length for a video is exactly as long as it needs to be and not a second more. Mm -hmm. um, in general, with videos for YouTube, you want to stay under 5 minutes. Um, by about after 5 minutes, people are going to start getting bored and they are going to start clicking uh, on a different video. So you want to make your point as quickly uh, and as simply as possible. Great. That's excellent advice. So um, I think we'll hold the rest of the questions to the end at this point so you can keep going through your uh, section. Cool. Go ahead. So sort of the next point that is uh, much more tool intensive uh, than the others is screen sharing. So this is sort of um, you know, getting into the, uh, the cursor, follow the cursor sort of videos uh, as Janet mentioned. Um, and what we, we use uh, Camtasia by TechSmith, but um, as mentioned before, there are other tools like Jing um, that let you record the screen. Um, and we've mostly used this for, um, you know, for demonstrating software and processes. Um, so we, we've actually done a series where we actually did uh, demonstrations of some donor management systems. And we used the screenshots and the video that we recorded uh, during those demonstrations to put together uh, a video overview. Um, so it's a very similar sort of thing. This lets you see cursor movements uh, and sort of follow through the process of actually using software. Um, it doesn't have to be software, um, but because it's screen sharing, uh, anything on the computer. This can actually be really helpful for uh, tutorials uh, especially. And the nice thing, um, when you're using a tool like Camtasia or Jing, they let you do some callouts, which is like this black bar uh, on the screen there. This is something where um, you can, in the software, make it draw a little box or a circle or a check mark or things like that to call attention to certain sections of the screen. And sort of Moving on from that, a little bit of step up is sort of idea of an on-demand module. So this is kind of a, a cross between screen sharing and recorded seminars, and this is actually something I'm working on now. Uh, we're working on a series of, you know, of about 10-minute long on-demand recordings of a uh, of a course of training. So this is five. It's the same type. It's five one and a half hour long webinars that we've turned into ten to fifteen minute little sections, um, and we've been doing this in just like screen sharing. We've been doing this in Camtasia. Um, you can use similar tools as well, um, and this sort of lets us blend uh, PowerPoint, including PowerPoint animations, um, as well as video, uh, with sort of the ability to put in callouts. Um, so being able to add like a little scribble or a little check mark um, and other ways to draw attention to certain parts of it. And because this is shorter, um, about, you know, again about 10 minutes long, um, this helps break uh, an entire course of trainings into smaller chunks. So someone can do you know, one or two a day instead of having to sit through an hour and a half or having to stop and start. Um, this is uh, a bit more similar to something you'd see uh, as a training, uh, specifically in the, uh, usually in the, in the for-profit world. You see a lot of like employee orientation or things like that um, that follow this sort of section, uh, this idea of having small modules that they can do um, as they have time to do it. Then this is the more resource and skill intensive version uh, of these would be an interactive e-learning module. Um, so there are actual, you know, so e-learning tools like Articulate uh, is the one specifically that we use. Um, they let you take your PowerPoint presentation and turn it into a full e-learning module. The advantage of this is you have sort of the, you have sort of a table of contents along the side. So if someone had to stop partway through, they can skip around um, down through the list to, to a certain section. These also let you include things like quizzes, 
uh, polls or interactive modules. So like uh, the screen that's displayed on this slide here, um, you can actually click on those blue buttons and it, sh it pulls in a call out that shows more information. Um, again, this is fairly widely, this sort of technology is widely used in the for-profit uh, sector for trainings. This is really good for processes. Um, you know, uh, a sandwich shop might have sort of a click the different parts to make the sandwich in order to teach someone how to, how to make the product. Um, this is, it's certainly more involved and these are more expensive sort of tools than things we've talked about. Um, so that's what Idealware has been doing in the, in the world of online training. Um, and I'd certainly uh, love to hear some, some more questions right now. Great, Kyle. Well, we've been tracking some of these questions, and there are a lot of good questions coming in. And um, some are, are very specific to some of the tools you're talking about. Um, do you know of any good options for um, webinars or for phone, uh, basically phone services and webinars that have toll-free options or that are maybe less expensive for both the uh, webinar provider and for the participant? Um, so. Uh, in, in our direct experience, we use ReadyTalk, um, which does offer a toll-free line. Um, it can be, it, it's, you know, it's not, it's certainly not uh, very cheap for the nonprofit using it. I'm, uh, I'm sure there's, a, I'm sure someone would want to uh, argue with me on that. Um, but uh, it does allow a toll-free option. Um, and as far as sort of the the cheap, uh, uh, as far as cheaper audio conferencing for you know for the organization, we've done for our free uh, webinars where we're not collecting any money. Um, we use ReadyTalk just for the slides, and then have people call in through free conference call, um, which doesn't cost us any money, but it is not toll free. Um, it's also not exactly the highest quality, so you, you get what you pay for, um, and you pay for nothing. So it's not the most user friendly. Um, it's certainly worth it's certainly more worth spending more to have that toll free number, um, which is it's, if you can afford to do that, it's much nicer uh, for your constituents um, when they're calling into a webinar. Absolutely. So a, a bit of balancing there between free or something with a charge and the benefits you get out of that. Yeah. Um, great. Well, I, I also have a specific question here on what tools uh, did you use, or could you talk a little bit more about how you made those uh, uh, on-demand modules, the 10 to 15 minute on-demand modules? And I, I think that this is, uh, you know, with regards to the video, the slides, the animations, and call-outs, how do you put those together? So for on-demand modules, um, it takes three parts. First we have the slides themselves, uh, the content which we make in PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint is actually really flexible um, if you know what you're doing. <laughs> um, it does get, PowerPoint has, been, has a reputation for being overused or kind of abused, but when done correctly, uh, the animation features um, allow you to add a lot more dimension. So actually on the lower right of this slide, um, that's actually a screen capture of one of the animations we've done. It's actually a bunch of emails flying out from a computer. Um, it definitely helps to have like a hand-drawn hand animation. Um, so if you, if you create the images yourself instead of using uh, clip art or anything, it improves the quality. But you can certainly create more complicated animations in PowerPoint. Um, the second part of this is audio. Um, so for audio, like Janet mentioned, we use Audacity, um, which is nice because it's free. <laughs> um, it's a free open source download. Um, and it's fairly easy to use. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and it lets you uh, just really quickly create uh, MP3 or WAV audio files. Um, I tend to prefer MP3 just for size constraints. Um, and, then, and then the third part is sort of bringing together uh, the visual element and the audio element. So we, I specifically use Camtasia for this. 
Um, you could also make it in a video editing software um, like Adobe Premiere Elements um, or iMovie or Windows Movie Maker, um, anything that I mentioned before. Oh, and Susan asked what the audio tool was, and um, that's Audacity. Um, it's a free download. Um, and then as far as including video, um, you can include video just like you would include um, a PowerPoint slide. Uh, you, you would make your video separately uh, in your own video editing software and then import that into your, into your project to edit. Great, thank you. That's a very thorough explanation of that. So I'm sure that's very yeah. helpful. Um, and at this point, I'm actually going to see, I believe Janet is still on the line. So um, we have some questions that perhaps either of you would be able to answer. And so uh, first off, um, do you have a preference between hosting your uh, materials on YouTube or on Vimeo? Or perhaps another tool uh, that, we haven't, that we aren't aware of? And Janet, if you're there, I'll have you take this one first. I am. I think you know YouTube really has so much reach that it can't be beat. I love Vimeo. It's beautiful. It's pretty. It's a great place if you're not looking to broadcast to a large audience. But the reach on YouTube, you know, you just can't beat it. It's easy to share. Uh, their video quality now is as good as Vimeo's, which wasn't always the case. Um, so you know, it really depends on who your market is. If you're going to do something really pretty, put it on Vimeo. Um, but it won't have the reach as YouTube, so put it on both of them. I, I totally agree with Janet there. Um, Vimeo is mostly used by video professionals. Um, it's much more artistic. Um, so if, if that is your target audience and you don't care about reach, then Vimeo is fine. Um, Vimeo has a few benefits over a basic YouTube account. Um, Vimeo lets you have a, an unlimited length. Uh, it, it lets you have much longer videos. But uh, for non if you can, if you get a nonprofit account for YouTube, you get that same benefit. You can also include clickable calls to action. So, like having in the middle of a video a link pop up to say, "Click here to donate" um, during a fundraising video which is uh, a great advantage over Vimeo. Great, uh, great. YouTube, uh, YouTube also has uh, another range of features. It has some video editing features. So you can actually take um, the videos that you have in your YouTube channel and put them together to create one larger video. Um, it lets you make uh, sort of if there's like an edit you missed or I've had this problem where I let the video run too long after it ended, uh, YouTube will let you go in and trim that. Um, and they just released a face blurring uh, feature where you can actually blur out uh, people's faces to provide anonymity. Um, so there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of advantages to go to, with YouTube over Vimeo. Great. Sounds like YouTube is really expanding their options. So that's great to hear. And along those lines, when you're posting things publicly on the web, is there anything that you do uh, with regards to copyrights or uh, what type of permissions you're allowing people um, to protect your creations while still sh sharing them out? You know, gosh, do you really need to protect your copyright? I do this for a living. And the more information that I can give out there, the better it is for me. So unless it's really information that you want to keep proprietary, put it out there. It's all going to come back to you, and it's going to be much better than it will be if you just sit on it and limit who gets to see it. Um, I think the, with, with YouTube, lets you, uh, when you post a video to YouTube, that lets you choose either a YouTube copyright license, um, or you can choose Creative Commons. I believe, I don't know the specific Creative Commons they use, um, but it's one that lets people reuse your video as long as they provide attribution. Um, I think the biggest issue with copyright isn't protecting your own information, but in respecting the copyright of, of the content you're using. Um, mm, for, if you're making a video and you want to include music, you have to make sure not to use copyrighted songs. So. Basically, if you heard it on a radio or it's a popular song, you can't use it in your video on YouTube. 
without permission. YouTube will actually remove your video if it contains copyrighted material. Um, so it's very important to respect other people's copyrights um, more than it is to protect your own. I'm really glad you brought that up because that's something that people do all the time. Um, another thing is grabbing images off the web to use in your videos. You have to be really careful when you do that because if those images are copy protected or they're in Creative Commons and they want attribution, you need to honor that and be careful about copyright. Exactly. Very good points there. Very good uh, points to not just think about our own copyright, but the copyright of other creative works that are out there and different ways to, um, to think about that. So very good. Um, we have time for just one more uh, question. And I'm seeing uh, several people asking about uh, ways to uh, track um, specifically employees, but there might be other uh, volunteers or other reasons why you may want to track who is watching your online training so that you can give them due credit for having done the work. So uh, do you have any recommend recommendations for that? Hmm. <laughs> and if, um, if not... So, I guess um, sort of in a broad scope, um, I deal where we also provide uh, reports, which are PDF files, um, that pe visitors on a website in order to access that. Uh, they're free, but you, you have to register with your name and email. Um, that's, that's one way we use to track that. Um, as far as like live webinars, um, or even the recorded ones that we sell, um, th those also require, um, because there's a payment stage, they require going through a registration step. Um, and we can also, and then uh, your conferencing tool like ReadyTalk will have registration in there. Um, I can't think of a way uh, to check exactly who is watching, say, like a YouTube video um, or something that doesn't require registration. Um, you can certainly track through an analytics tool um, how many people have seen it. But I can't think of a legal way to know who exactly is what. <laughs> Great. One of well, the and things I think that – sorry, go ahead. go ahead. One of the things that I do with the videos that I control that you know, I release um, through a paid system is I release them through a membership-only website so that I have access to who gets – into that content, and then I host the videos on Amazon and restrict the viewing and sharing of that content to just those pages. Um, that's really the best way to lock it down if that's what you need to do. Um, that said, I've, I don't do that very often. Great. It's more important to get your information out, um, especially if you're looking at uh, just like a basic free video than it is to uh, – it, it, there's much more benefit to that than putting up that wall of registration. Absolutely. Agreed. And I know that um, what maybe we'll do is, is take this question offline to the forum and out of the webinar and uh, see if we can get uh, – if you have any more to say, we can add to that. I know one of the kind of side topics here is, is for those people who are dealing with learning management systems for their employees. And so there may be a little bit more there. And so uh, just a reminder, because we are just about out of time, that we will be sending out a follow-up email that will have a recording of this webinar and also a link to the forum where we, we will be addressing all the questions that we did not have time to get to during this hour-long session today. And so I just would like to um, thank everyone for uh, coming today. I'd like to thank Janet and Kyle uh, for presenting their, based on their experience. And also uh, thank Don and Kevin and Stephanie who have been assisting with the chat as that's been quite busy. I'd also like to remind you that we have the TechSoup website where you can find the fo forum, uh, blog, information about product, donations, and our newsletters. You can sign up for our newsletters there. And just a reminder that TechSoup is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that provides technology and tech resources to nonprofits. 
And we also would just like to thank our webinar sponsor today, ReadyTalk, for uh, providing us this platform. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'd like to remind you to please fill out a brief survey that will pop up at the end of this. It will help us continue to provide excellent webinars on the information that you need. And uh, again, look out for that email with the recording and links. Thank you all, and have a good day. Thanks, everybody.